One of the problems with understanding the ecological impacts of any invader is the first sign we have that an invader is coming in and causing changes is the invader comes in and causes changes. And so at that point, it's too late to ask what condition the ecosystem was in before the invader arrived. So we knew we had an interesting opportunity because we had several years of data of pre-invasion conditions in the river. And so if we could just keep watching the Hudson until the zebra mussel arrived and then saw how it changed, then we would have a very firm basis for understanding what this invader does to ecosystems. Zebra mussels are small striped bivalves, like clams and oysters. And it's very easy for humans to move zebra mussels around. Zebra mussels have these microscopic larvae in the water column. So you can imagine you might have a little water in a bait bucket or in an aquarium or in a live well in a boat. Anything like that can move zebra mussel larvae around. We knew it was in the Great Lakes and the Great Lakes are connected by waterways to the Hudson. So it was fairly certain that they would get here slowly but steadily, no matter what. We had been studying the Hudson for a few years before the zebra mussel became imminent. You ready, David? Oh, good to go. We're headed up to our long-term monitoring station we call Kingston. We're gonna measure a bunch of physical parameters like uh, temperature, dissolved oxygen, light penetration. We'll also take a whole host of water samples that we'll take back to the lab and process later. And uh, this is what we do every two weeks. Okay, we're anchored. I'll get the pump out. We wanna know what are the physical characteristics that these animals have to deal with. So the temperature is 9.7 degrees Celsius. The oxygen is 104.7%. So this is a Secchi disc, and that tells us how much sunlight is penetrating the water. Because it's very turbid today, it doesn't have to go very deep before you can't see it. Now, right about there, I can see it. And then I'll look at the rope to see where it's marked. And the depth was only 20 centimeters. The phytoplankton, which are one of the members at the base of the food web need sunlight to grow. So when we measure the amount of sunlight that can pass through the water, we can estimate how well the algae can grow. And then we want to also look at all of the other parts of the food web. The bacteria, protozoans, the algae, the zooplankton. I don't think there are many animals in there right now. There's not much in there. Nearly everything that we measure in the Hudson River changed when zebra mussels arrived. Zebra mussels came into the river. They were first seen in 1991. By 1992, there were about 500 billion zebra mussels in the Hudson. Zebra mussels are filter feeders, and they can only eat certain size class of things. So. They mostly eat the small algae, the phytoplankton, and some of the very small animals, what we call zooplankton. They came in and they started eating, and because the zebra mussels could eat so much, it was a radical change, and you could see it quite quickly. We saw about an 80% loss of phytoplankton populations. And the smaller zooplankton, the little tiny guys, fell by about 90%. And overall, the amount of zooplankton in the river fell by half. And that's interesting because that's fish food, right? So we reckon that about half of the fish food in the river disappeared when zebra mussels came in. So in fact, the bulk of the Hudson's fish community suffered as a result of the zebra mussel invasion. People are going to be a little upset that they're not finding their fish. Something all of a sudden disappears. You should kind of worry about what's going on with your ecosystem and is your water still healthy? in the 1990s. We understood, documented, described the short-term acute impacts of the invasion. The rapid outbreak of the zebra mussel population, the loss of phytoplankton, 
the ensuing impacts on the other parts of the food web and on water chemistry. And all that would have been true and right, but it would have only been part of the story. Keeps bringing them. Fully loaded. Here's a rock and you can see that there are some older zebra mussels on it, these larger guys, which are a few years old. And then you can see all of these small ones that are attached on here. These all settled out last August. So now what we're seeing is each year there appears to be more and more smaller ones. And that the larger ones somehow are not making it from year to year. the lifespan of the mussels has gotten much shorter. So it used to be that the mussels would live six or seven years, and now it appears that most of them are dying after one or two years. The logical follow-on question is why have these changes occurred? Um, and I think it's fair to say we really don't know uh, at this point. There are a bunch of things that could be killing zebra mussels in the river, causing them to die younger than they used to. There could be diseases in the river, there could be other uh, predators other than crabs. Uh, it could be that the mussels are themselves in just such poor condition because they've eaten themselves out of house and home. We, we don't know, but we do know that what a zebra mussel eats depends on how big it is. So only the biggest zebra mussels can eat zooplankton. And so the zooplankton populations are starting to come back. The river is always changing. Some of those changes are natural and they're what we would call normal progressions and some are not. So the, again, the more information you have, the more you can pinpoint what's causing the changes that you see in the river. We don't know if this recovery is the long-term fate of the river or whether this is just a, a short phase itself. Certainly what's happening now in the Hudson is very different from what was happening in the 1990s. And so that's a new problem for us to try to study and understand. <laughs>